great. You can go ahead and start. All right. Us. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our panel about safeguarding the rule of law. Um, a few housekeeping things from our moderators. Uh, first, cell phones off or silent. Um, second, if you like what you see, tweet at ACS Law, hashtag ACS 2018. Um, we also want you to uh, check out page 56 of your program. There's a letter in there drafted by ACS about the rule of law. Uh, please sign it. Please send it to others who share our values. It's really important to kind of spread the word. Um, so uh, I'm really honored to be moderating this panel, um, though I have to confess that kind of uh, keeping up with rule of law violations in this day and age is like a little bit tricky. <laughs> so the poor panelists have had to deal with me rewriting the questions every couple days because something new happens that we have to talk about. I mean, I thought I had it nailed down. I get off the plane yesterday. I haven't checked Twitter in a couple of hours. and. Um, I tell my coworker I'm doing this panel, and he's like, oh, you're going to talk about those DOJ line attorneys who just withdrew from the Affordable Care Act case, right? And I'm like, oh, man, are you kidding me? So anyway, so it's all to say <laughs> uh, it's a vast subject, and the way we've decided to approach it is to pick out just a, a couple of specific instances where the Trump administration has really undermined rule of law, kind of go deep into those, and then try to provide some context. So how atypical is this? What kind of long-term damage are we looking at? Um, are we normalizing what's going on? And, um, you know, because we're lawyers and we've all heard the kind of old saying, hard cases make bad law, right? The idea that if you've got this kind of extreme set of facts and you try to craft a rule, you'll wind up sweeping in too much, too much stuff. Um, we also want to think about, you know, ways in which, because we're all so terrified of the Trump administration and what it seems to be doing, um, we're potentially taking stands uh, that will kind of undermine our values in the long term. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with kind of presentations from each of our panelists about a particular aspect of the rule of law that seems to be under siege. We're going to reserve a little time for kind of discussion among um, uh, the five panelists, and we're going to try to reserve, you know, a little less than half the time for kind of questions from the audience. So, um, so. You know, Sally Yates said last night, rule of law is not just the stuff that's written down, it's these kind of deeply ingrained, long-standing norms about no one's above the law, that in this country we don't use state power to kind of punish our rivals or reward our friends. Um, and each of our panelists has, in one setting or another, kind of lived those values. So their full biographies are in your program, and um, they, they really need no introduction, but I'll just go down the line really quickly so we know, so you, so you get to know um, who you're talking to. So um, I will start with, um, to my left, the Honorable Norm Eisen, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, Co-founder and board chair of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. He is the reason that everyone in this room knows what an emolument is. <laughs> um, he, uh, he's been cited 5,000 times since the election, and he's spearheading two of the kind of corruption suits against President Trump. Um, next to him, we have Asha Rangappa, um, who's a lecturer at Yale. She's a former special agent at the FBI, and perhaps relevantly, she specialized in counterintelligence. Um, we've got Daniel Goldman, who's a former assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. He uh, worked a lot in organized crime. Again, perhaps relevantly, did some prosecutions of Russian organized crime. Um, Justin Walker. Assistant Professor at the University of Louisville, Brandeis School of Law, former Executive Director of Global Game Changers, former law clerk to Justice Kennedy, um, and recent thrower of the first pitch at a University of Louisville baseball game. <laughs> and finally, David Strauss, a law professor at the University of Chicago, Director of Chicago Law's Supreme Court and Appellate Clinic. Uh, he's argued 18 cases before the Supreme Court. He served as special counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And he's worked at both the Office of Legal Counsel and the Office of the Solicitor General in the DOJ. So please give a hand uh, to our panelists. Ready. All right. uh, so we're going to start with Norm. And um, Norm, you've said that uh, people thought you were smoking something when you first brought up the emoluments clause after the election. 
Um, and now, you know, we've sort of seen all the ways, kind of large and small, that President Trump's global empire has kind of benefited from foreign governments. So everything from diplomats at the Trump Hotel, foreign governments in the Trump Tower, you know, the Panamanian government fixes the sewer system around Trump buildings first. Um, so um, I guess I want to talk a little bit about just how atypical is this? Why do the founders care so much? And what is it about these foreign emoluments violations that, uh, that you see as so corrosive to the rule of law? Uh, thank you, Isha. Hello, panelists and ACS. Uh, um, I'll just take a moment before I describe how extremely abnormal, it's like bizarro world, if any <laughs> of you read, read Superman comics as kids or otherwise. It's an upside down uh, world that we find ourselves in. But I will just take a, a quick moment of my allotted time to say how gratified I am uh, to be at ACS, uh, to uh, recognize uh, 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 Caroline Fredrickson, who's here with us, my friend. Uh, and I often do, at Crew, we do a tremendous amount of work with ACS. You'll see a number of reports on some of the most pressing issues of the law of Trump uh, jointly produced by the Crew ACS Presidential Investigations Project. So very happy to be here. And I actually was around a number of friends of mine. I was talking to one of them last night, Rob Malley, uh, Jeff Kleinberg, and others, when ACS was founded. I remember I was in a book group with a bunch of them. <laughs> and I remember them kibitzing uh, what is now many years ago here in Washington about the founding of this organization. Of course, their dream was that someday we'd have panels like this in room after room in a big convention to counterweight some of the things on the other side. So great pleasure to be here. And the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it, just in uh, the past day, the past 24 hours, uh, we've had an example of the, uh, the danger uh, of uh, monuments with the ZTE deal the Chinese telecom that's getting off for a slap on the wrist. It's nothing to China to have to pay a, a billion dollars in change for a company that's worth $20 billion. One that is a repeated uh, serial uh, sanctions violator, North Korea, Iran, some of the most threatening regimes in the world. Uh, and one that poses a profound national security threat, including because of the prospect of uh, telecom eavesdropping that they represent. At the same time as Trump is cutting this deal at the, uh, over the uh, bipartisan howls of Congress, we'll see if anything comes of it, there's a bipartisan bill, um, we've heard in recent weeks that uh, Ivanka Trump, our group crew, found some of them, uh, got a flow of new, valuable new trademarks from China, and Trump himself, a part of an Indonesian, uh, Trump organization is part of an Indonesian uh, property development deal in which a Chinese state-owned company made a $500 million investment. That's kind of the, the actual settlement number should be closer to $2 billion because you've got to count the value of that $500 million and of the trademarks and all the other benefits from Trump. That is a shocking state of affairs. Uh, and it happens over and over and over again since the beginning of this administration because Trump insisted, this is why Indonesia is relevant, he insisted on hanging on to his ownership interests, even though some of the management, only some, uh, because he talks to his sons all the time, some of the management has been rolled off, uh, but he's insisted on hanging on uh, to his ownership. So that $500 million is a direct benefit to Mr. Trump himself. And this is just what the founders were so concerned about when they, uh, uh, when they wrote the Foreign Emoluments Clause and put it in the Constitution. I have to share some credit. Our Brookings paper that I wrote with Larry Tribe and with Richard Painter did uh, help drive attention uh, to this issue. Emoluments are part of the day-to-day -day life of those who like me, have worked in the executive branch because they actually I impact enormously, uh, for example, retired military officers who are not allowed to get these uh, things of value from foreign uh, governments uh, beyond a statutorily permitted de minimis amount. 
uh, they maintain their commissions for all their lives, so they can't uh, strict limitations on military officers going to work for government. When I was in, working as a lawyer in the White House, I got to be friendly with the head of the Norwegian Nobel Committee because they wanted to give a Nobel Prize to President Obama, comes with money and a handsome gold medallion, and we weren't sure if the Emoluments Clause would permit it. We never thought we'd have a president like this who is sucking in, starting at his hotel down the block, who's sucking in these enormously valuable gratuities uh, all over the world, uh, 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 in the Middle East, uh, in, uh, 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 from the Philippines, from India, uh, all places where we have the most acute national security issues and relationships. The Constitution doesn't require a quid pro quo. They're difficult to prove, but it's precisely because the country should not have to ask the question that we're asking over and over again. Uh, and it cuts through these issues, cut across all of the rule of law uh, predations of this administration. If you take the first Muslim ban, so patently unconstitutional. All those countries that were banned uh, 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 were ones that didn't do business with Trump and other nations I and others pointed this out. And these emoluments have become a theme now of all foreign policy coverage of Trump, uh, and much domestic, because there's a domestic emoluments clause too. Um, I and others pointed out uh, that other nations where Trump does do business, like Saudi or Egypt, were not included in the ban, even though they have a much more documented history, 9-11, Saudis and Egyptians much more documented history of risk the United States. So that question has hung over the administration. We are litigating uh, in the Southern District of New York. We represent crew, my watchdog represents with other distinguished counsel, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gupta Wessler firm, Deepak Gupta, and Joe Sellers from um, Cohen Milstein. Uh, we represent a group of business competitors we lost in the district court. We think that's a profoundly misunderstanding grounds, profoundly misconceived. It's on appeal to the Second Circuit. We represent with the AGs of DC and Maryland, uh, that state and uh, the district, and we won on standing grounds before Judge Massetti in Maryland. We have a hearing on Monday to discuss uh, the scope of the emoluments clause, the meaning of it. That will, among other things, should we succeed, will frame discovery. And then there's a third case. There was oral argument yesterday on standing also congressional plaintiffs in DC. So the, since Congress is of Trump's own party and they have been supine, uh, we the majority, uh, we've had no choice but to litigate and these three cases are going and defending uh, Trump. I've gone on too long, but I'll say one more thing. For me, the theme of the Trump administration is his attacks on the rule of law. It is the single unifying theme. It's the through line. And the pushback of the rule of law is the most encouraging story of the era of Trump. And we'll get into this. But I'm confident that he's there's too many violations. There's too many lines of attack. There's too much exposure. And the rule of law is going to bring him down, whether it's in front of a jury of his peers a jury in Congress or the jury of the American people, he is going to be held accountable because of the rule of law. Your lips to, you know, fate's ears. <laughs> um, um, Are we not allowed to say God? We need all the help we can get. God, help us. <laughs> um, uh, well, thank you for your work on that issue. Um, Asha, I want to talk about uh, Spygate. Um, and when I wrote this, I when I drafted this question, I sort of said, extreme criticism from President Trump and his Republican allies. But of course, in the past few days, some of those Republican allies have deserted him. Um, so President Trump uh, accused the Bureau of planting spies, of trying to sabotage his presidency. Um, and you've written that these critiques not only sort of dramatically apprehend what it is that the FBI does, um, but you've controversially said that uh, progressives are a little bit to blame for those misapprehensions. Um, so I was hoping you'd tell us a little bit about kind of what's wrong with these critiques, how are we to blame, and sort of where to from here. Yeah, so 
you know, I think it's important to remember that rule of law, I think, as Sally Yates said, is not just about what's written down, um, and, not, and I think not only also about the values that they embody, but it's also about the faith that we have in the processes, that, that we believe that these processes are legitimate and that the people acting in them are ultimately good faith actors. Um, and I think it's important to remember that one of Putin's goals in these active measures is to basically erode that faith in the legitimacy of the process. Because once that's eroded, it's very difficult to rebuild that back psychologically. And so where I think uh, you know, kind of progressives come into this is that you know, having been in the FBI, um, well before Trump came on the scene, you know, there's always been this narrative, and, and I'll say, you know, it's kind of from the extreme, you know, left, but I call it a bad actor theory, um, as opposed to a bad or imperfect process theory. A bad or imperfect process theory is, you know, there are loopholes that are going to be um, utilized to the extreme by the executive branch because that, that's the tendency of the president and, and law enforcement to take advantage of every tool at their disposal we, and you know to, to check that we need to uh, make sure that those loopholes are always closed. So for an example of this is post 9-11 warrantless wiretapping. Um, you know, FISA law, it was written in 1978. It didn't take into account technological changes and things where geographic boundaries would no longer uh, be the dividing line between where FISA applied and where it didn't. And, you know, under Jack Goldsmith, they brought it in uh, to uh, interpretively, uh, quasi-legal in terms of you could argue there was a gray area. Um, when that was exposed, you got this section 702 um, that basically codified what could be done and what didn't. You know, th that's what I think is the bad imperfect process like theory where you assume the executive branch is going to always be looking for opportunities to, um, you know, exert its power to its maximum. The bad actor theory is that it actually doesn't matter what rules you have in place because the people who are behaving in this process will always find a way, or, or will, will essentially break the rules, um, and will try to go after people no matter what. And I think that this, again, was seen in the FISA narrative, right? Um, this is an extensive process. It came after the church hearings. Uh, it involves multiple people uh, from the Department of Justice and the FBI all the way up to the FBI director, the attorney general. It ultimately goes before a federal judge. And there was this whole like rubber stamp, you know, they, the FBI can spy on anyone. It's not really true. But um, this narrative, I think, has been there for decades that you know, it's kind of this tinfoil hat, like, you know, the FBI has this whole room bugged and they're listening right now. They're not. Um, and I think what's, what you've seen is that uh, the Trump administration and Devin Nunes have essentially co-opted this narrative and it's, it takes on more force, quite frankly, when I think conservatives are making it because they're the ones who are always law and order. So if they're saying it, it, it must be true. And you have these really ridiculous now notions, but they have gained, they're not coming out of nowhere. They've been, I think, in circulation for a long time. They're just now being made by a side that we haven't seen it come from before. Um, but the bad actor theory ultimately, I think, uh, erodes the rule of law, um, it erodes faith in the process, it assumes everyone is acting corruptly, and at that point, when you believe that the entire process is corrupt or illeg illegitimate, um, no matter what the rules are, then all the outcomes will always be questioned. So that's where I think uh, we need to be careful, both in terms of our rhetoric and where we're kind of uh, assuming intentions on the, on the part of civil servants who are in the system. Thank you, um, and that's, that's a lot for, for, for progressives to chew on. Um, so, okay, so, so Danny, uh, the next topic I wanted to cover is um, the pardon power. So, so from the beginning of this administration, there have been a series of controversial pardons, starting from Joe Arpaio, going up to the nation D'Souza most recently, um, maybe Trump himself in the future, judging by leaks and tweets. Um, and you've sort of made the case that this pardon power, kind of contrary to popular belief, is not unlimited, it's not totally plenary, that when it's used for a corrupt purpose, that's not something the Constitution contemplates. Um, and so I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about 
what's the case that Trump is fundamentally misusing this power? Um, and why should we care? Why is that so bad? Sure. Well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for, uh, for coming and for us being here. I was actually a uh, law school chapter president back in 2004 and was at the very first convention. Uh, and then yesterday, I had the honor of joining the board. So it's a real pleasure to be here um, and to be able to talk about what I think, you know, from last night's dinner is, is clearly uh, one of the central issues in our country right now. Um, before we get into some of the pardon powers, I, I think it's helpful to kind of take a little bit of a step back and to assess where we are and who we're dealing with, right? We have a president right now who, according to his original campaign communications director, ran for president because he thought it would be good for his business. He had no expectation of winning the nomination, much less winning the presidency, and this was really a business proposition for him. Um, he's also the first president in, in modern time who didn't disclose his tax returns, which would reveal, obviously, a lot of information about his business dealings. And he's uh, the most, and, and I think most importantly, he is someone who has never, ever served in any public service of any sort. So even if you have businessmen, and there have been businessmen uh, who, who have you know, gone on to politics, plenty of them have become president, you can, you've, you've had generals, but everybody prior to becoming president before Donald Trump served this country in some capacity. And Donald Trump ascended to the presidency pretty explicitly to serve himself. And so that's the framework that we're looking at all of these issues as it relates to obstruction of justice, as it relates to the pardon power, is that we have someone who has completely turned the norms that we became accustomed to on their head. And it kind of crystallized, I think, in the last couple of weeks, when he, including this morning, when he, he said on television, again, that he has the absolute right to pardon himself. And I think everybody, not just us in this room, but everybody around the country cringes when they hear that. There's something that just gutturally makes us think to ourselves, that can't possibly be right. We cannot possibly have somebody, the only person in this country who has the ability to pardon people from federal crimes cannot actually use that for his own benefit. And so then you start to think, all right, well, that must be written somewhere, right? <laughs> no, it's not. And this is where I think it gets very tricky. And I think that, you know, and, and Norm has written a lot on this, um, and a lot of people, you know, much smarter than I have, have really looked into this. But as I look into it, I think it's, first of all, very important to separate the pardon power from obstruction of justice, okay? Obstruction of justice, uh, as it's being investigated by Bob Mueller right now, is uh, codified in criminal laws. There are criminal laws passed by Congress, ultimately uh, by the president as well, that cabin the power of anybody I would argue, and others have argued too, anybody who uses their lawfully permitted authority for a corrupt purpose. And the, the, I think it's generally, I mean, it's not obviously, there are plenty of people on Fox News who disagree with this, but uh, including our president, but there are many instances where you would use you know, lawful authority in a in a corrupt way that takes what is permissible conduct into criminal conduct, right? You can imagine a bank teller has the lawful authority to take money out of the bank for, you know, for customers, right? But the bank teller does not have lawful authority to take someone else's money for himself or herself. That's one of many examples. Obviously, public officials cannot take bribes to use their, uh, their lawful public authority, publicly granted authority. So that's, a, that's the, the more obvious examples. And I think it's an easy step, um, and Richard Pildes at NYU has written about this, how if, if that is clear, and it's obvious that the bribery statutes 
can cabin public officials, then there's no reason why the criminal statutes against obstruction of justice cannot cabin the uh, authority of the executive branch or of uh, public officials. But that's different than the pardon power, which is constitutional only. There's no law governing the pardon power. It's just simply in the Constitution. And it is one of the very few unfettered powers that the president has. And traditionally, it's not always been used you know, in a um, public-oriented, uh, generous, or what m one might call you know, the best practice use of the pardon power. I mean, let's look at Bill Clinton. He pardoned, you know, his, his campaign uh, contributor, Mark Rich. Um, that, and he got a lot of flack for that, but he did it at the end of his presidency. And the real check on the pardon power is not a law, but it's the political consequence of it. That's kind of how it was designed. And so as we think about the pardon power um, and how it can be cabined, there are good legal arguments why some of the same ideas that underlie obstruction of justice, the take care clause that the president must take care to faithfully execute the laws that put some degree of uh, duty or an onus to act in good faith, and that could easily transfer over to the use of the pardon power. The president takes an oath to, uh, to execute the laws and to abide by the Constitution. Um, and there are you know, many um, who would say that that oath brings with it some sort of a fiduciary type of duty that you must uh, execute your constitutional powers in a, um, in a, in a faithful or good faith uh, way. But I do think that the, the pardon power, and, and other than that guttural instinct that we have, it's, I think legally it's a little tricky. And um, to my mind, I, I think the political consequences, which is really ultimately the check on, the, the intended check on the pardon power, are even with these mealy-mouthed Republicans in, in Congress, I think even they would object to the president pardoning himself. The bigger question is, what happens if the president pardons Michael Flynn, or Rick Gates, or Michael Cohen, or people who appear to be uh, potential co-conspirators in the president's own criminal conduct? That, to me, is the much greater threat, because whereas it's pretty, the, the, the reaction politically, at least, to him pardoning himself, I think, would end the discussion very quickly, he very well could do this. And that's, to me, what the message of this Dinesh D'Souza pardon is. Dinesh D'Souza was prosecuted by my office for essentially being a straw donor. Um, he organized for other people to give the um, maximum allowed amount to a friend of his um, from college who was running for office and who only lost by 46 percentage points um, <laughs> to, and in order to uh, use his own money to fund her campaign through other people. Now, that's a, a pretty obvious violation of the campaign finance laws. Um, it's, it's quite explicit. It was done with a, a knowing and willful intent to skirt those laws. Um, and ultimately, on the morning of his trial, uh, he pled guilty. And he went into court and he said, I violated the law, I knew what I was doing was wrong, but I did it anyway, and I plead guilty to this conduct. Because as most of you probably know, you can't just you know, sign a, a, on the dotted line to, uh, to enter a guilty plea. You actually have to say what you did in court before the judge in order to, uh, for the judge to accept that guilty plea. Now, two weeks ago or whatever it was, um, President Trump decides without going through any of the ordinary processes, and there's an office in the Department of Justice that uh, exclusively is intended to review the thousands of pardon applications that come through. And there's a process, and there are guidelines, and one of the critical things is the acceptance of responsibility. 
And another is what law enforcement thinks in terms of uh, this person or the potential effect on other investigations and other cases that might flow from a pardon on, on uh, this a particular individual. Not surprisingly, the president just bypassed that process altogether, did not consult with him, literally, according to him, had never spoken to Dinesh D'Souza before he called him the night before to say, hey, I'm going to pardon you tomorrow. And then he did it the next day. And Dinesh D'Souza, other than having committed this crime, is an incredibly incendiary fixture on the right who has uh, tweeted and said absolutely horrific things about any number of uh, other uh, minorities and discriminated against groups, et cetera. I mean, he's not someone who people like, perhaps, for example, Alice Johnson, who was recently pardoned this week, or commuted, her sentence was commuted this week, um, engenders some sort of understanding and, and empathy and sympathy. I mean, this guy, um, by all accounts, um, you know, pled guilty to it, still claims, by the way, even though he pled guilty, that it was, you know, quote unquote, witch hunt, it was a politically motivated prosecution, et cetera, and Trump goes and pardons him. So why is he doing that? I think one of the reasons, and then he starts talking about, by the way, about Martha Stewart, about Rob Blagojevich, you start to connect the dots, and these people committed the crimes that his associates are being investigated for. And I don't, it's not a coincidence, and I think that one of the concerns that we have, and people have also written about the notion of dangling pardons to people to convince them not to cooperate, and whether that's some sort of a violation of law as well, which is all of these are open questions because we've never had anybody in the office like this. And I think one real realistic possibility here is I think that the president understands there are political ramifications to him taking actions um, that run counter to what the majority of the country think. For example, he has not fired Rod Rosenstein. He has not fired Jeff Sessions. He has not fired Bob Mueller. He has talked about these things forever, but he hasn't done it. And at least with Rosenstein and Sessions, there's no question that he could, but I think he understands that the backlash will be really significant. And I think that's true with the pardons. But if he is signaling to his associates that he will potentially pardon them because he's pardoning Dinesh D'Souza or he's pardoning Martha Stewart for making false statements like Michael Flynn, like, um, uh, I guess, Rick Gates, right? He, yeah, false statements as well. Um, if he's pardoning Rob Blagojevich for corruption, I mean, look at Michael Cohen and some of these Russian dealings. Let's, we'll see where that goes. That's a signal that he is out there willing to do it. And I think that that's a real danger. So this is someone who's turned norms on their head. He's turned law on its head. And the challenge for all of us as we sit here thinking about how to deal with this is what is the best way to deal with it? Is it to litigate? Is it to try to come up with ways of turning these soft norms into hard laws by codifying them into law? I think that's, and we'll get into that, I think, a little bit. I think that's a very difficult task to do that. Forget about the difficulty in passing law. I think it's hard to, to turn norms into laws that are neither overbroad or under-inclusive. Um, I think that's a very difficult task. Yeah. Or is it, a a, is it voting? And that's why you know, some of the work that, that ACS and other uh, groups have done on the right to vote and access to vote becomes even more important because that is clearly a way to, to deal with this. And is it, the, or is it the political process? Is it writing? Is it putting pressure on congressmen, on senators to resist this, to find some backbone and resist what is clearly someone abusing the power of the presidency for his personal reasons? Uh, thank you. So, uh, Justin, um, you know, maybe kind of unusually for a progressive convention, a lot of the rule of law norms that we've talked about kind of internally in this group or at the convention in general have been um, about law enforcement. And um, many of the rule of law norms we've identified are about undermining the independence of law enforcement. And, and you've kind of written um, that some of the worst episodes in the FBI's history, so warrantless wiretaps, guilt by association arrest, those sorts of things, 
are actually a function of law enforcement being too independent. Um, and so I want to sort of start thinking about, are there ways that our kind of um, demands for President Trump to stop meddling, which seems so valid, um, could wind up kind of having unintended consequences? Do you have thoughts? I do, and I, and I think so. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be on the panel. It's an honor to be at the same table with these panelists, and I'm very grateful to ACS for extending the invitation to me. Um, very happy to be here. Um, you know, I think when, when President Trump fired James Comey, there was a, a bipartisan, you know, across the cable news spectrum um, consensus that the next director needs to be independent. And the FBI as an agency needs to be uh, independent from the president. And I can understand uh, that desire because, you know, when we think of independence from the president, you know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, some people probably think of, uh, the image in their head is, is maybe you said Sally Yates was a, a speaker at, at the conference here, um, you know, is, is someone standing up to the president and saying, you know, you're, you're asking me to do something that's wrong, I'm not going to do it. Um, and I think that sometimes that is what independence looks like. But I would suggest that sometimes independence looks a lot uglier. Um, I have in my head the image of a, of a Freedom Riders bus uh, in Mississippi uh, burning and um, a, a vicious uh, white supremacist mob, um, you know, throwing uh, incendiaries into the bus and, and beating the, the, the Freedom Riders who come out of the bus. Uh, and why were they there? Why was there not an, a, an FBI presence to stop them? Uh, well, the Attorney General had ordered FBI Director Hoover uh, to do what he could to protect the Freedom Riders. And Hoover had information about who was going to do the attack and when they were going to do it. And Hoover just simply defied his boss and said, I'm not going to do anything to protect the Freedom Riders, and he let this attack happen. And he, he exercised this kind of independence over and over again um, in defense of, of similar um, uh, very uh, uh, bad uh, values. And so I think independence can also look like that. And so when we're, when we're trying to figure out how much independence is appropriate, um, maybe we should start by thinking about what, what are the forms of independence from the president? Uh, and, and I think there are at least three forms of independence. One form is just outright insubordination. You know, President Truman orders General MacArthur not to send troops beyond a certain parallel and MacArthur does it anyway. That would be, you know, outright insubordination. Uh, another model of, of independence would be just um, insufficient monitoring by someone's superiors. So when, when President Wilson um, is in the, the later years of his presidency, the military is being used across the United States to suppress uh, the, the labor union movement and actually sets it, it, sets it back, so some people think, by, by several years uh, in terms of intervening in strikes and kind of siding with management. This is the, the U.S. military. Well, where's the commander in chief? Well, he's distracted. Um, by League of Nations, by World War I, or, or also possibly, you know, ill, uh, and, and that could have played a factor. But it, regardless of the reason, there's insufficient monitoring. And so the military has more independence than might be ideal. And the third kind of independence, third and last kind of ind independence I'll talk about, is the kind of independence that comes with undue influence. So, um, uh, you know, if you remember when President Clinton was elected uh, to his first term, he campaigned on a platform of, of allowing gays and, and lesbians to serve in the military. Uh, he becomes president, he wins on that platform, and, uh, and Colin Powell is, uh, is his, uh, you know, chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and disagrees with that policy. And so Powell exercises an enormous amount of, of influence and, and wages a uh, public and private pressure campaign using members of Congress, using newspapers, leaks, the whole thing, and uh, it, it exercises enough pressure that Bill Clinton backs away from his campaign promise and instead uh, compromises on, on uh, the don't ask, don't tell policy. So whether it's insubordination, whether it's insufficient monitoring, whether it's undue influence, um, you know, in, independence can have different forms and it can cut in different ideological directions. And so when it comes to the FBI, uh, I think that its independence, it's exercised a lot of independence over its history. Um, at, in some eras, more independence than others. Um, but whether it was uh, James Comey's independence from Loretta Lynch, whether it was uh, Louis Free's independence from Bill Clinton, a president he loathed and, and would, would basically not speak to, um, 
or whether it was J. Edgar Hoover's independence over you know, four or five decades, um, the FBI's independence has often uh, been um, an, an unhealthy force. Um, in, in the story of an FBI that, that uh, in other respects has been an incredibly healthy force and, and uh, you know, has, has done some of the most important things that, that I think have been done in, in American history. Um, so what about independence of the FBI, uh, what has it looked like in the context of federal law enforcement? Uh, and I think um, that I'll mention three episodes from the FBI's history that I think are some of its kind of ugliest chapters and uh, just, just talk for a moment about how independence was maybe not the, o certainly not the only cause of those chapters, but how independence uh, made those chapters worse or made them possible. Um, so one is uh, the FBI's uh, mass detention program during World War II. Um, the, the military's Japanese internment program is, is, is much more famous, but the, the FBI was responsible for detaining around 10,000 innocent uh, American civilians uh, during World War II. Um, and you know, this was a detention program that uh, the FBI director's boss, the attorney general, opposed. Uh, Robert Jackson said, shut this down. This is, this is not right. Uh, and Hoover just went right on with it. And then Jackson's successor, Francis Biddle, was attorney general. He also said, shut it down. He said, this is unwise. He said, this is illegal. And, uh, and Hoover just changed the name of the program and kept right on, kept right on doing it. Um, if Hoover had not had the independence that he had, uh, it, it, that, that, uh, that kind of ugly chapter uh, might, might not have looked the way that it looked. Uh, the, the second of the three uh, chapters I'll mention uh, is the, um, the FBI's kind of aiding and abetting of McCarthyism. Uh, particularly during the Truman administration. You know, Truman opposed McCarthy, and, and Truman was uh, not especially sympathetic to the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, but uh, his FBI director was very sympathetic to them and kept, kept McCarthy in business, uh, feeding him intelligence, feeding him uh, staff, giving him McCarthy speechwriters, uh, and then siding publicly with uh, HUAC and, and McCarthy um, uh, over, over Truman. Um, and so, um, you know, once again, if, if the FBI director had not been so independent of the president, um, then there wouldn't have been as much fuel uh, for that for the McCarthy fire. Um, and the FBI turned out to be a, a very, very effective form of fuel for, for McCarthyism. Uh, and then the, the third of the three uh, chapters that, that I uh, will mention is uh, the FBI's warrantless wiretapping over decades of Hoover's administration. Um, thousands of, of people, often based on their political views, um, uh, their, their pr progressive views, um, but sometimes based just on their, their identity, whether it was uh, sexual orientation or race, uh, were, were warrantlessly wiretapped by Hoover. And this, again, was a program that um, attorney generals under Franklin Roosevelt opposed and attorney generals under Truman and Eisenhower wanted nothing to do with, but uh, this was an example of the insufficient monitoring form of independence. The, the attorney generals under Truman and Eisenhower basically said to the FBI, just don't tell us what you're doing. I want some plausible deniability. Um, but you, you know, here, here's your blank check. But, but just don't, don't fill me in on the details. Uh, and so it had some pretty drastic consequences, not just in the abstract, but, uh, but in, uh, in concrete terms for individuals who were targeted and, and um, uh, spied on, um, and harassed. So, um, you know, the takeaway for for me is is not that, um, you know, presidential power over the FBI is good. Uh, because I like presidents, you know, some presidents I like, and some presidents I don't like. Um, but I think you want a rule, um, going back to something you said in, in your introduction, you want a rule that is going to be applied not just today, but tomorrow and the next year and the next term and for the next president, when you don't know whether or not uh, the, the subordinate of the president is going to be more conservative than the president or is going to be more liberal than the president. And so, you know, I, I'm uh, not especially sympathetic to FBI independence, um, not because I like, not because I care about the president, but because uh, I care about um, individual liberties and civil liberties. Uh, and if you have an FBI that's independent of the president, it means that you have an FBI that's, that's independent of the people because the president's accountable to the people. Um, but if the FBI is not accountable to the president, the FBI is, is not accountable to anyone. Uh, thanks, Justin. Um, 
So David, we have now kind of identified a few of the ways that President Trump has begun to undermine the rule of law. And they've all made headlines. They've all ginned up a lot of outrage, particularly from folks like, like people in this room. Um, but when we were emailing, you said you started to worry about normalizing what's going on, despite this sort of constant din. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit, like, what do you mean by normalization? And how are we, kind of President Trump's critics, maybe complicit in that? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Isha. And yeah, you hear a lot of talk about normalization. Let's not normalize what's going on now. So I thought I'd try to say something about what that might mean, as Isha said, and um, what, what can be done about it and why it's such a bad thing. Uh, let, let me start here. I mean, in any society like ours, there are going to be disagreements about policy. There are going to be very serious disagreements. And because we're in a democracy, things are going to happen that many of us oppose, maybe bitterly oppose. We think they're very unjust, and they shouldn't happen as a matter of policy. Um, but they happen because we got outvoted by our fellow citizens, and we have to live with it. And we can uh, we we don't like it, but um, but that's. That's how you play by the rules of the game. But then there are things that are outside the rules of the game, that are not part of the normal democratic game, in which bad things can happen. But these are outside that realm. And what we've been seeing in this administration uh, is outside that realm. The, the things that my fellow panelists have talked about, the abusing the power to enforce the criminal law, trying to avoid legal accountability, the personal corruption, and the sort of relentless and shameless willingness to say things that are not true. These have no role in a democracy, unlike legitimate policy disagreements where the other side might be wrong, but they were playing the game. These are things that really are outside the bounds of what a democracy should allow, and it's important that we do what we can to make it clear that these things are unacceptable. Now, I really want to single out two influential groups of people who I think are at risk of normalizing these things. And I really want to emphasize they're at risk of normalizing these things partly for reasons that are very admirable. The groups I have in mind are journalists and judges. Um, I do think, and this is, I think for many of us in, the room, in this room, this is not true, but I think for a lot of people, there's just a tendency to kind of resist the notion that these things are out of bounds, that they're abnormal, that they're not like what we ordinarily see. There's a kind of tendency to say, oh, you know, yeah, oh, stuff has always gone on that wasn't so great, and we'll get through this. There's, that's a tendency, I think, that's common to people. I think those of us in this room are here because we are not, we're not uh, succumbing to that tendency. I do think it's a human tendency. But I think for the groups I identified, um, it's, it goes beyond the psychological tendency. It's a matter of self-image. It's a matter of the role they see for themselves. And as I said, in many ways, it's admirable. So I think journalists who are accustomed to dealing with political controversy, accustomed to dealing with politicians, including politicians they don't like, politicians they disagree with, they know how to do that in normal times. They know how to cover political controversy, including political controversy in which they might have views. They know how to be, in their minds, even-handed to present both sides of the argument. Maybe in their role as commentators, they'll make it clear what they think. Maybe even in their role as reporters, they'll kind of let on what they think, what side they think one side is not, is not right and the other side is, is. Judges the same way. They know how to deal with a case. And a case will come up and one side is right and the other side is wrong. They know how to think about these issues and how to decide, uh, how to decide the case. They look at the facts, they look at the law. They know how to do that. I think issues like these, like what's going on now, requires people to break out of those familiar templates and to do something different and to realize, no, this isn't just a normal disagreement. Something's going on now that is out of bounds. And that challenges people, and journalists and judges are good examples of this, challenges people to come up with other ways of writing about these things when reporting about them and also how to think about cases in which these issues arise. And it's not normal for them. And it's, as I said, it's because they want to do their jobs well. And in normal times, doing their jobs well requires a certain kind of even-handedness. But when something like this comes along where people are not playing by the rules of the game, the same rules about even-handedness should not apply. And it's a real challenge, and it's unknown territory for people in these categories about how do you deal with this how do you deal with an administration that tells untruths all the time, 
I mean, sure, occasionally politicians will say things that are not true. And you can call them out maybe in a qualified way, maybe in a suggestion, just a, a suggestion. But when they do it all the time, what do you do? Do you write story after story after story after story that says, well, the Trump administration is lying again? I mean, that's going to go against the grain for a journalist. Or for a judge, when the judge is presented with a case that involves the government of the United States coming before him and saying, we decided to make this decision for national security reasons. Well, that's a familiar thing. Judges deal with that. They take a look. Usually, if it's national security, they take a cur cur cursory look. They figure, you know, the administration knows more than we do. They're probably acting in good faith, or at least close enough to it. I'll give them a lot of deference. Um, and to say to them, you know, no, treat this crowd differently. This isn't the same. This isn't the same as a group administration of any party that we've seen before. You have to treat them differently. You can't give them the benefit of the doubt that you're used to giving to other administrations. That really goes against the grain. And it goes against the grain for good reasons, but it's something that, that I think people in those categories and all citizens have to, um, have to accept, have to think about these things in different ways. Let me just give you one historical analogy that I, at least I find useful in thinking about this. It is Jim Crow segregation in the South. You know, people ask the question, you know, can it happen here? Can authoritarianism happen here? Well, it, it did happen here. It didn't happen in the whole country. It happened in certain parts of the country. But the Jim Crow regime in the South was an anti-democratic regime in which large numbers of people were not allowed to vote. It was an authoritarian regime, and it was supported by private terror. And that went on for decades in this country. And in the legal mainstream, not among everybody, of course, but in the legal mainstream, that was viewed as more or less normal. That was not viewed as alarming. It was just kind of life as we know it. Now, when the, when the courts finally stopped viewing it that way and finally started identifying this as, no, this is something we need to extirpate in our country. This happened after World War II in particular in the Supreme Court. When they, when they realized that they started to do things that judged by normal legal standards were very questionable. And a lot of the great decisions of the civil rights era when they were first decided, Shelley against Cramer, the restrictive racial covenant case, the white primary cases, Brown against Board of Education itself, many cases reviewing state criminal justice systems, were criticized in good faith by mainstream legal scholars on the ground that, you know, that's really not the law. You're really stretching the boundaries of the law, maybe to the breaking point, and they were. They were stretching the boundaries of the law, but they had to stretch the boundaries of the law to deal with a situation that was not normal and should not be allowed to persist. And that, I think, is the way that we have to encourage judges, and I said journalists, and our fellow citizens, and government employees to start thinking about the jobs they're doing now to deal with a problem that is not like anything we've seen before, that can't be addressed by normal means, it's a challenge because it requires you to do things that stretch, and you don't want to be, don't want to be acting lawlessly, you don't want to be acting illegally, um, but you have to respond to this challenge. And I think that is what it means to escape normalization. Wow, um, thank you. Very sobering thoughts. Um, so I have a lot of questions. I want to continue this discussion, but I think maybe we should turn it over to the audience. So folks, there's a microphone in kind of the middle of the room. Folks who have questions, if you could kind of move to the mic um, to, to kind of ask what you're thinking about. Uh, you know, we have sort of a wealth of experience on this panel, and I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you all very much. Um, my name's Brian Maloney. I'm with the uh, lawyer chapter in Pittsburgh, and um, Pennsylvania had its own kind of constitutional crisis a little bit with um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and the gerrymandering decision that happened recently. And then um, several Republican legislature, le legislators uh, proposed impeaching them based on their decision. Um, and that was a, a very threatening uh, a moment in the, in the state. And I got calls from several folks at ACS about, you know, how do we respond to this? Um, and my initial reaction was, you, you just can't even take that seriously. Um, it's just such a ridiculous thing. Um, but luckily, um, other folks did take it seriously, and the Allegheny County Bar Association in Pittsburgh issued a statement saying how wrong that pr uh, proposal was even to propose it, um, and the chief judge of the Supreme Court, who is a Republican, issued a statement saying much the same. And it was surprising to me to see the statement from the Bar Association, um, but I think it was also extraordinarily effective. And so I'm interested to hear folks' thoughts on um, kind of these types of nonpartisan civil society uh, 
type organizations like the American Bar Association, uh, you know, the um, you know, commerce organizations, um, these types of organizations that don't typically get involved in political type decisions, just speaking up and saying this type of thing is wrong um, and, and how effective that might be and, and any risks that you might see associated with that. I, I think this gets to a little bit of what I said earlier about, you know, having to reinforce um, that, that we have to believe in the legitimacy of the process regardless of the outcome, right? Because we're starting to enter a phase where legitimacy is based on whether we agree with the outcome or not. You know, that we see the president. If it's a decision that he doesn't like, it's a so-called judge. If it's news he doesn't like, it's fake news. If, you know, the outcome of an investigation um, is something he doesn't like, it's, you know, the corrupt, uh, you know, 13 angry Democrats um, investigation. And, you know, the, I think that that kind of um, thinking is starting to actually get, permeate. Um, and I do think that it's important for civic institutions to start engaging um, in the conversation and reinforcing uh, the legitimacy of just basic values, um, inclu including um, processes. And I think it's especially important for for these institutions and for us to speak up even when we disagree with the outcome, right? Um, you know, again, I think that the left can be as guilty of this as the right of, you know, not willing to give any credit to <laughs> anything that doesn't kind of come out the way uh, that, you know, that aligns with policy preferences even if the process through which it went through was Legitimate. This is how. This is the way we function, and I think right now it's those institute these these processes that are under attack, and we need to reinforce, uh, you know, our faith in their legitimacy, regardless of whether um, it comes out the way that we always want. The, the one thing I would add, and it goes, I think, in part to the normalization point, is that if things are normalized, um, and particularly if the politicization of just about everything in our society is allowed to continue. I mean, that's ultimately what's happening. A lot of institutions like the ABA that, or other you know, nonprofits that, that try to, or that are required to be uh, apolitical and nonpartisan, feel nervous or anxious about engaging in a conversation that increasingly seems to be political in ways that didn't used to be political. And I think that we need to encourage the institutions to resist that and to speak up when something is obviously wrong and something should not be, should not be countenanced, should not be considered, and should not be allowed to proceed. And some, you know, the problem you run into is that people in the ABA, of course, have different political beliefs. So the ABA is going to be nervous about making a statement that addresses something that is has been politicized. I mean, Donald Trump has politicized this Mueller investigation to you know the nth degree. It now reads, if you watch Fox News, as a completely political witch hunt with where the career prosecutors who are uh, prosecuting this case and who, some of whom I worked with and I am certain do not think about the political background of any people that they're investigating, no matter who they gave money to in a campaign or not. And that's the oath that we took, and that's what they're doing. Um, and now it's turned into a completely a political whitewash or an attempted at political whitewash. And we have to resist that. We have to be able to say it's not a political issue. It's something that is just right and decent and fair, and the truth matters. And I, I personally have no idea where the Mueller investigation is going to go. Based on what I know, I would not charge Trump with obstruction of justice right now if I had to go into court. I think that's a very difficult case to make. But we'll see where it goes. But the point is that we need to promote the notion that, like Asha said, these processes have to go forward and we have to let things play out. And we can't succumb to the politicization of everything that we have to try to take a step back and say it's not political, this is just right and wrong. Do you have something on that? Well, I'll, uh, I'll chime in first. Since we're studying uh, historical parallels, I do think Jim Crow is an important one 
Um, I will point out that uh, America has cycled through these periods of intense partisanship before as well. As ugly as things are now, it can't possibly be any uglier than the scurrilous uh, campaigns that were waged around Hamilton and Jefferson and some of the founders are really astonishing. We've descended back to, back to that level from the Cold War comity that was forced on us by the existence of, uh, of an external enemy. And I, I do think that it is, um, while we have to resist undue politicization, I would say that um, in my view, we're facing a crisis of the republic. And beyond that, really, a crisis of the transatlantic liberal project that uh, stems from the first efforts to contain the British monarchy, uh, the way those uh, ideas were, and those are both, those include successful and unsuccessful British revolutions. Um, the, Brits came up with one solution. We came up with another ping pong at the time between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And since those twin revolutions, there's been a struggle to impose a new form of government uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And we are still very much, we make the mistake, I've just, forgive me for going off on the historical tangent, I'll bring it back, but I've just written a book. I've just spent three years of my life writing a book about the large cycles of, um, as in the past hundred years since 1918, uh, the, the large cycles of um, liberal and Ill, illiberal struggle in Europe. We had a big one post-Wilsonian democracy, post-World War I. Uh, it uh, collapsed because America took her eye off the ball. We withdrew from Europe. That left us with the carnage of World War II. Then we had a second. Incredibly, the same thing happened again. America was fatigued, withdrew a second time. After World War II, it left us with the Cold War, and we've done it a third time. And every time, and you do need to understand this, I think, to understand the moment we're in and the, the war cry, the urgency. Uh, every time we do that, it splashes back on our shores to devastating effect. World War II was an example. The Cold War was an example. And I fear a third great uh, cataclysm now. So that is, you know, I'm reading my Churchill that's the moment we find ourselves in, and I don't understand how any, and there's some very good friends of mine, I don't understand how anybody is not on the barricades of democracy, because that's the nature of the threat we're facing. That carries with it a risk, that narrative I've just provided carries with it a risk of politicization, I think, uh, but uh, to my mind, uh, so be it, because it's a war. Uh, an internal war. It's a, the, a second, I believe, a second American civil war. By the way, we have these, there's other examples. Uh, the, 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 the post, there were post-civil war moments. The 1930s were a moment where there was serious discussion in America of communist revolution. It was a very real threat. So periodically we go through these upheavals and you've got to go to the rule of law barricades to defend them, if that's a little political. <laughs> but is it political? Is it saying these are our democratic institutions and we must defend them no matter what the outcome is? It's not that we want them to, you know, uh, we, it's not that you're saying we need to maintain our democratic institutions. We need to preserve them so that Obamacare can last. You know, we're saying that there's an actual attack on the institutions that, that we're defending the, the institutions wherever they come out. And I guess my point would be to try to emphasize the latter, not the next step, which is so that we can pass X, Y, and Z. Well, I won't. The line is growing long, but I think <laughs> there's a necessary, there's, that has necessary political consequences. And for example, how severely you might judge a presidential policy that would otherwise feel good uh, because you're at war. There's a need 
to to press. Uh, however, I I'll I'll, con I'll bow to the yeah. questioners. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jules Bernstein. I have been a union and worker side lawyer here in D.C. for well over 50 years. Uh, and recently, uh, I uh, met with Carolyn and a few other people, John Hyatt, the former uh, general counsel, the AFL-CIO, um, <coughs> and uh, Rob Wiener of uh, Arnold and Porter, and we put together the, this uh, uh, idea of getting out to the legal profession, uh, and there is a letter in here that we are asking uh, people at the conference to send to their bar associations and other communities about protecting the rule of law. So I just want to put in a commercial for that project, <laughs> uh, which I think is very, really very worthwhile. I just want to remind people, and, and uh, uh, Daniel Goldman said something about the bar associations uh, having been neutralized when Bork fired Archibald Cox. The next day, Chesterfield Smith, who was the incoming president of the American Bar Association and who had voted twice for Nixon, uh, made a statement saying, no one's above the law and we need a new special prosecutor. And uh, Jaworski was appointed and the bar stood up against um, Nixon uh, and Watergate. And somehow or other, perhaps because we now have these uh, uh, mandatory bar memberships, we've gotten somewhat neutralized, but we oughtn't to be, and the bar has to speak out, point one. <clears throat> point I, I'm just going to take my panelists uh, precaution because we're running out of time and there are two behind you to limit you to one point. It was a valuable point. Well, but, page no, no, 56 no, no. I, of the I, I, This is more important when you hear it. I, I'm sure those hear, other folks you behind hear, you also well, believe well, it's, uh, to, it's important. Yes, let's, here, Norman, but, could, could we respond to the first point? I, I, it's just a quick response, but you know, there's, you're the second questioner to, to mention the ABA and the ABA's speech, and I think you both raised good points about the value of uh, speech from organizations like the ABA. And I wonder if, um, if, the, if it raises the question of whether there's more value than is sometimes assumed when it comes to the value of corporate speech, whether it's the ABA or whether it's the New York Times or whether it's the AFL-CIO or whether it's Citizens United. My second point is last summer on the Vineyard with my former president of the New York Bar, uh, Mike Cooper, we decided that people still have under the Constitution, the First Amendment, the right uh, to, uh, to seek a redress of grievances. And we put that together with the idea of censure. And we started something called censuredonaldtrump.com. And if you go there, you will see 48 grounds for censure and we have over 60,000 signatures. And while impeachment doesn't look possible, censure has more viability. So we're, we keep adding to the grounds. And we, I propose that you take a look at that and try to advance what we're doing on that score. And we will be sending it to Congress and trying to get censure off the ground. After all, Andrew Jackson was censured for less than this guy has done, and so was Joe McCarthy, censured Thank you. by the, Thank censured you so much by for the Senate. So let's, let's not lose that one. Great. Thank you so much for your work. Go ahead. Um, I feel there's often an elephant in the room with discussions like this, and that is we're focusing on Trump and the people in power and not saying a word about the 30 to 40 percent of our fellow citizens who continue to support and enable this behavior. So one of the speakers last night, I confess I can't recall if it was Sally Yates or Judge Marshall, invoked uh, Learned Hand's Spirit of Liberty speech. And so I think if we're concerned about the rule of law, we can't just ignore um, what's going on in the citizenry. So I guess what I want to ask is, 
what role is there, if any, for the shaming of the people, of the Trump base, the people he is appealing to, the people he's doing this for. Now I know Democratic partisans will say, no, there's no political percentage in that. We're not gonna win anything by telling people they're stupid and evil <laughs> and all of that. But I'm not asking this as a political strategist. I'm asking this as somebody who's concerned about the rule of law and what's happening. And so, you know, in, in, if it's elites who think, well, you know, we can't do that because it'll just reinforce the idea that we're elites and we have contempt for the common man. But to me, it's kind of an elitist reaction to basically say, oh, those people are so hopeless, we shouldn't even try to talk about them, or we should just ignore them. So, so anyway, I, you know, should, there, should we be talking more about the shameful behavior of a significant percentage of our fellow citizens and condemning them for enabling and encouraging the kind of malfeasance that's going on and the kind of spinelessness that's going on in Congress, or should we just keep pretending that this is just about Trump and not about what the people in the electorate um, love him doing? And I love that David Strauss wants to respond to this. Yes. I can't wait to hear oh, well, thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I have wait to hear what I have to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you. Um, uh, a couple thoughts. Um, uh, I, there is a real issue there. I mean, the fact is that, that this person was elected and still has a lot of support, judging by public opinion polls and judging even more significantly by the support he's getting from Republicans in Congress who certainly know better but are afraid that they'll get primaried if they even breathe a word against him. So there's plenty of indication that he has support. Two, two thoughts, though. I, I, don't, I, mean, I, I, don't, I mean, I'm not a political strategist either. I don't think you get much mileage out of directly ridiculing, criticizing people, telling them they're, they're, they're bigots and idiots. I don't think that's going to win you any friends. I do think there are people who probably are unreachable on this issue, as there are in any large heterogeneous society. They're just going to be people who are unreachable. But I do think there are substantial numbers of people who will respond, especially if elite sentiment is relatively unified and can kind of get across the notion that certain things are just not done. And I think we've seen that in our time when certain things that used to be respectable stopped being respectable, um, mostly because of elite sentiment. And people, you know, like, like being overtly racist in public, which used to be fine. Um, uh, even among sort of respectable people who are overtly racist, overtly anti-Semitic, of course overtly homophobic, that's in my lifetime, uh, and overtly sexist. Um, that's, um, that's, that became inappropriate, and it became inappropriate mostly because elites conveyed the message that we don't behave that way. One of the prob one of the, the most pernicious things and very, very pernicious things that Trump has done is to legitimate a lot of that stuff. But having said that, I think this is an area in which there's going to be a segment of the population that is susceptible to that. They're not where we are in thinking what's going on now is terrible and has to be opposed vigorously. Um, they might even think, eh, it's, a, you know, it's okay, he's got a couple points, he's done some good stuff, I kind of see why people are unhappy, why they elect him. Kind of, he seems okay with me and I'm, I'm a Republican. Um, I think there are people in that bracket who can be susceptible to messages coming from elites, which means including elites on the other side of the political aisle, who convey the message, no, this is really not, you know, we'll, we'll go back to being Republicans and pursuing our Republican agenda you know, but, but this, is, this is not it. This is not it. And I, in, a, in an important way, I think that has to be our audience if we're worried about normalizing this stuff. It has to be people like that. It has to be like the Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, who was a Republican, who said, look, I think the decision is wrong, but this is not the way to go about criticizing it. I think that is, a, that is the, the sort of um, uh, elites with whom we are disposed to disagree politically are a key part of our audience. Uh, well, uh, the country will not survive if 40% of it subscribes to Trump. Fortunately, that's when you dig in. We do polling and focus grouping at crew. And when you dig in, you find that uh, sentiment is much more nuanced than that. Those are people who I used to, I mean, I'm obvious, uh, very obvious, a member of the coastal elite, and I wouldn't hide my, you know, I used to go around, travel around the country trying cases, and I tried it as a, you know, uh, <clears throat> with my Brooklyn accent and all. 
Uh, and uh, these are, many of them are, 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 are good, decent um, uh, uh, Americans who are very upset about a series, and with merit, upset about a, a series of policies, mostly conservative policies, but there's been betrayals on the center and on the left too, that have left them in the lurch. And I think we need to attend uh, to, um, we need to attend to persuading them uh, and not just uh, fighting them as part of this larger battle uh, that I describe. And I think there has been, in the, in the work that we do, I think there has been, we are seeing erosion in the strong support for Trump. Ironically, the impeachment talk and some of the other, you know, very vigorous attacks actually drive up Trump's, there's a martyr uh, syndrome. We saw it a lot in Clinton. Uh, Newt Gingrich was more responsible for Clinton leaving office with those historically strong approval ratings than anyone else in America. And that's something that's important for us to bear in mind. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Molly, and I just finished my 1L at the University of Virginia. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, and this question is for Mr. Eisen, but anyone can answer if you have thoughts. Um, so it seems like for the emoluments clause, the most popular solution is to require the president to put his, his or her assets in a blind trust. Um, but in reality, how, who would be the one to make that rule? Would that be us relying on Congress to actually do something? Um, and in this current climate, that seems kind of unlikely. So um, would we, should we as the left, as progressive lawyers, be pushing future Congresses for presidents beyond this one to still require to have a blind trust? We should. There are constitutional issues with how far Congress uh, can go under the separation of powers and otherwise to uh, impose uh, conditions on uh, the presidency. I'm of the view that, um, that there's more that can be done. There's been a number of bills introduced to push the ethics law further out. Um, we, the presidents currently disclose. There's no issues about disclosures. So for example, we could get more we could get the president's tax returns. That could be a mandatory disclosure. And um, um, I, I think we could provide, because it's constitutionally based, you could at least provide that the president shall not accept foreign or domestic emoluments. In the argument yesterday, there was there questions and good questions about how far Congress could go and whether Congress has the power to do that. But uh, yes is the answer. I think we should do more. Anyone else have a thought about emoluments? That was a specialized one. That was a specialized question. <laughs> no one wants to, to right. <laughs> no one wants to go after normal. I have subject. a sort of specialized question too. It's really um, for you, Daniel. Um, but anyone can answer it who has thoughts, obviously. Um, so um, I'm wondering whether Mueller could be including in his plea agreements a waiver of the right to seek a pardon, the way that defendants often have to waive the right to appeal in plea agreements, and um, if so, I wonder if it would even have any value given that President Trump could just ignore such uh, a limitation, but um, I wonder if, a follow-up question, if that could be used as a basis to invalidate a pardon, um, if that was part of the plea agreements that had been agreed to, um, and do we know if Mueller has done this at all? Uh, well. The plea agreements we've seen, he's not done this. I would be very surprised if he were to do it. Um, I also think it would have very little impact since it wouldn't affect Trump's ability to actually issue a pardon. Um, you also can't, you know, contract around, con you know, around the Constitution uh, to in, in that way. Um, so I, I think. Part of what you're getting at is sort of to what degree is Mueller our savior? <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, one of the concerns is putting so much stock in his investigation to, to get, you know, whatever progress we're looking for. And I think we need to be careful of that. Um, he's almost certainly not going to 
charge Trump. Um, he's already charged his campaign manager, his national security advisor, his deputy campaign manager, and doesn't seem to put a real dent in Trump. So, or in anything that he's talking about or in anything he's trying to do. Um, and so I, I worry from, from the progressive standpoint that we're all kind of waiting for this you know, big event that's going to somehow remove Donald Trump from the presidency. And I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I do think that there's going to be uh, another indictment. And I think there are going to be people involved in the campaign who are going to be charged um, with some degree of uh, collusion um, with Russia during the campaign. It's not going to be Trump. Um, but I think, you know, people like Roger Stone are very much in the crosshairs. I think Paul Manafort is very likely to get charged with more crimes. Um, and it will, the, the, the fact that we have right now with the, the tweets that Asha was talking about, the hoax, the witch hunt, the angry Democrats, all that stuff, it's a one-way street right now because Mueller's not talking and nobody knows what he has, so they have the entire airwaves to themselves and they're taking a political approach to trying to undermine the investigation because I think Trump recognizes or thinks that he's not going to get charged and therefore this will ultimately be a political issue for Congress to decide whether to impeach or not and if he can provide himself with political cover by undermining the credibility of the investigation, he gives the, Congre the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans, as well as the base, um, some rationalization for how they can respond to what is going to be either a pretty you know, damning report on obstruction uh, and or an indictment outlining some of this, uh, this collusion. But it's not ultimately going to change the policy of charging every single uh, illegal alien crossing the country with a crime for entering illegally and separating them from their children. And it's not going to um, resurrect the integrity of the FBI and the Department of Justice. And I, so I think that for people kind of waiting for this big uh, event to occur that's just going to fix everything is a, is a fool's errand and that everybody needs to be focused a little bit on, uh, focused more I would say, on what else is out there and what can be done to counteract some of these policies and you know to Professor Strauss' point, it's, it's not a function of shaming people. It's a function of trying to message in a way that reaches people. And Donald Trump is brilliant at doing that. This spygate is the biggest farce that you could ever come up with. But it's one word. And all he has to do is say that, and yeah. half of the country thinks, oh, the FBI did something wrong. And in order to counteract that, you have to explain, well, you know, confidential informants are allowed to do this, that, and but you've lost half the people right. once you start going down that road. So, so, so let me let Asha respond really quickly, and then we unfortunately have to wrap it up. I'm so sorry. But let me let Asha respond, and I'll promise the panelists will stick around for another couple minutes if you want to come afterwards to ask your question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to echo this idea that Robert Mueller is not going to be Superman. And I think uh, this, especially in one respect, which people I don't think fully understand. His investigation is primarily a counterintelligence investigation. So if you look at the appointment letter, the first part is for him to uh, look into possible coordination between members of the Trump campaign and Russia. This is the collusion piece. This is basically, were they helping Russia spy and conduct their covert operations and active measures? The second piece of the uh, appointment letter is to investigate any crimes arising out of it. Now, having conducted counterintelligence investigations, I can tell you that there are a lot of ways that people can act on or behalf of a foreign power that is not criminal, okay? 
if you are trying to influence uh, the Republican National Convention to change the policy on Ukraine on behalf of Russia because you're being tasked to do so, I mean, there's not really a law that that violates. The closest you get is the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which is you know, kind of a weak uh, law. It's a weak fit for this kind of thing. So it's just important to understand that we are so focused on what Mueller is going to charge people with. And the way I describe it is his charges are like watching a few scenes from an entire movie and then trying to make sense of the movie. His counterintelligence investigation is the whole movie. And I think that what we need to be asking is how will he be able to convey to Congress and to the public the full scope of what he uncovers in the counterintelligence part of the investigation, which will lay out what Russia was trying to do, how they were trying to do it, who was helping them on this end, uh, even if it did not cross the threshold of criminal activity. And one way that he is doing that is by indicting Russians. So if you read the indictments on uh, the 13 Russians and the three companies, that's like it lays out exactly exactly what that social media operation is. Um, and I think that part of the reason that he's doing that, knowing that he's not going to ever actually get these people in court, is to be able to tell that side of the story. But unclear whether he'll be able to you know, bring criminal charges to tell those stories, he's going to have that in a report. And I think we should just look beyond the criminal charges uh, and wonder how that part of it is going to make it out to Congress and the public. So I'm going to give Norm 30 seconds to respond because I know Christopher's glaring at me. So go ahead, and then I'm going to kick you guys up to the Hey, next Christopher question. can glare at me now. A, <laughs> a friendly amendment, we should act as if we have no guarantee that this is going to happen. But I feel, uh, but we don't know, and it could very well be that Michael Cohen flips tomorrow and has tapes of Trump committing FCPA violations. We don't know. That off-ramp could happen at any time, but, <laughs> but we should not assume that it's there. I myself, I'm a defense lawyer by training, not an FBI agent or a prosecutor, and I know what it feels like when the walls are closing in. <laughs> the walls are closing in on Trump. Thank you. So a round of applause for our panelists. And I'm going to direct folks to um, see two of the women I admire most in the world, my former boss, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and uh, Melissa Murray, professor and dean of Berkeley Law, uh, in the presidential ballroom. Thank you all. <laughs>